Hi everyone, I'm Jack Rambling Rack and Turn. I hope that you're doing well. I'd like to join in on the top five English novels videos I've saw going around this past weekend. I of course saw the one from Eric at Lonesome Reader and Sarah at Hardcover Hearts. Their wonderful discussion is linked in the description box below in case you haven't caught it yet. That prompted Hannah from Hannah's Books to share her five favorites. And I love that video as well. So I'm jumping in. This hasn't been weaponized as a tag yet, uh, but I wanted to share my five favorites. And these are just five favorites. Uh, one or two of these could slot in or out, you know, but these would all be in my top 10. And right now in late spring, early summer of 2022, these are my five favorites. These are all novels, no poetry or uh, drama. Um, they're all from English writers originally published in the UK. And I should add as sort of the preface, I'm from the Southwestern US. I've never been to the UK. I've never been to London or England. I would love to go one day with my family, but these are just books I really love. I've enjoyed reading and rereading. So we're going to kick off in the 18th century with The Life and Opinions of Tristram Shandy Gentleman by Lawrence Stern. This is one of the funniest books I've ever read. It is a book I, <laughs> that makes me laugh just thinking about it. My wife and I will quote for, uh, jokes from it or puns from it to each other, at, at least on a bi-weekly basis, if not weekly basis. Uh, it is, it's a book that was written at a time where the, the tradition of the novel didn't quite exist in Europe or in the UK. And so Stern felt, I think, free to experiment, to try different things out. And so he parodies the many memoirs of great individuals and gentlemen that were coming out at the time, but he does it in so many ways. He's not just making puns, which he does. He's not just making satirical references, which he does. Uh, he's not drawing in real world events and then making slight changes to make them goofy. He does all that. But the whole narrative is just stuffed with innovation and with just quirky little ideas that even now when we read it, it feels fresh, it feels new, it feels original. Uh, and that's a special quality, I think, for a book to have after 200, 250 years. Um, I'll just <laughs> include as, as one um, key refrain across the book is that, you know, Tristram Shandy is trying to share his life and opinions, and yet he can never quite manage to get to the point where he's born to start his life and opinions memoir. <laughs> he repeatedly will go like, I'm getting ahead of myself. I've not yet been born. We have to find out about his father and the mishaps in which he, his father and mother conceived young Tristram. Uh, we have to find out about his uncle and his uncle's war entry. We have to find out about the accidents that befell when, when they were trying to actually name Tristram himself and all sorts of nonsense that ensues. It is unbelievably funny. If you haven't read it yet, I highly recommend it. Uh, particularly if you think you're a reader of, you know, postmodern literature, maximalist literature. When I first read it in college, the joke was it was postmodern before there was any modernism to be post about. And that stands true. If you can find the Florida edition, that has a lot of great notes at the end uh, to sort of amplify just how, how, how deep the humor is across that book. So we move from there up into the 19th century. And I actually have a copy of this one out. We haven't stored it up yet. And that would be Middlemarch from George Eliot or Marianne Evans. Uh, this book is a world unto itself. If The Life and Opinions of Tristram Shandy Gentleman is just unbelievably funny and we're, we're discursive and exploring what the novel can be, this is one of the great summits of what the novel can be within that more narrow tradition of the novel. Um, what George Eliot or, or Evans accomplished in this book is unbelievable. She creates an entire world, she peoples it, she fills it with life and vitality, and then allows that world to develop, to grow, to mature. Um, in a way that, that feels unbelievably natural, that feels unbelievably authentic and, and unbelievably humane. Even characters that we dislike within Middlemarch, and we get to know a lot of folks, we get to dislike a fair amount of folks, um, they feel real. They, they, they feel like people who, who have a goal or a desire, and, and we can sense that um, even if we disagree with them or dislike them. And so the, this, the wonderful humanity that, uh, that Elliot created in this book is top-notch. I think it is the finest example of, of what that 19th century world-building novel was capable of. Um, and one that, again, if you haven't read, check it out. Although, you know, George Eliot wrote a number of great books, so this just happens to be the best. Uh, moving from Middlemarch, <laughs> which is arguably like the, the most well-crafted novel of all time, into the modernists. Uh, and sort of, you know, if Middlemarch is the summit of that 19th century traditional novel, I think one, the, the summit of modernist novels is, in my reading, Mrs. Dalloway from Virginia Woolf. I don't have a copy of that out. It's stored up, but I do have her essays, and this is uh, from the time period when she was writing Mrs. Dalloway. Mrs. Dalloway is a book that accomplishes so much in such 
you know, a concise novel. It's not this long, expansive, expressive novel. We don't know all the details. We know only the essential details. There are aspects of the book that feel almost impressionistic, the way that the clock tolls and the characters are, are paying attention to the clock, the way that everything is stuffed into that single day. Um, and and every, every thread that runs through it is just unbelievably crafted. The sentences are so fluid, so beautiful, such that when Wolf's narration jumps from one character to another, it's, it's almost seamless. There are streams of consciousness flowing together into this great river of life in that one day. And that's something that I've very rarely seen accomplished from a technical side in terms of writing, uh, in, in terms of the depth and again, the humanity that is on display. With, with Wolf, we are starting to penetrate into human consciousness to an unbelievable degree. It's like we have this laser, this, this scalpel that just can cut into the minds of characters. And within their minds, we then discover the heart of those characters in a way that again, we'll feel, it feels like Wolf is in love with some of these characters. Um, and, and that she was accomplishing that. And when we read her, her letters or her diaries or her essays, and we see the, the thought she was putting in, the doubt she was filled with as she crafted this masterpiece, it's unbelievable. Um, it, it, is, it is an unbelievably tragic book. And yet it is so beautiful and so crystalline. And underneath all of that surface, just brimming with life, that, that it's a book I've reread a number of times. I reread it just last year and love it just as much today. And Wolf had a couple of peaks. There's there's a mountain range in the modernist, you know, uh, range of mountains. There's a whole mountain range of Virginia Wolf. And I think Mrs. Dalloway is, is the peak as far as I'm concerned right now. Um, moving forward, so we've had three, Life and Opinions of Tristram Shannon Gentleman, Middlemarch, and the great Mrs. Dalloway. You move into postmodernism. And if Wolf is the queen of modernism, and George Eliot is the queen of that, you know, traditional novel. I think A.S. Byatt is the queen of postmodernism. And I, I think Possession, while having a couple of flaws in it, is unbelievable. What Again, what Byatt is able to accomplish, the way that she draws in uh, dueling narratives and manages to weave them in and out almost seamlessly to allow what's going on in one narrative to comment and critique and interrogate what's going on in the other. And to allow that from, from both sides, that the narrative set in the 1980s and the modern novel from when the era was written, uh, when the novel was written, to have that look back at the Victorian era and ask questions and interrogate how women were treated or the, the opportunities that were available to, to people from different walks of life is fairly common. And yet to then have revelations occurring in that Victorian era narrative that allow us to look at what's going on in the modern era and ask questions about that is unbelievable. Again, that's something that very few writers are able to do and able to craft. Uh, and so that on its own, I think, would make it this miniature masterpiece of a book. But when we add in the postmodern element, when we add in the, the fact that Byatt went and created pastiches of Victorian poetry, letters, uh, diary entries, um, little fairy tales, and that all of these are crafted in different voices, that we have letters from a, a Victorian era poet who is so obviously a stocking horse for Robert Browning, and then letters and diary entries from who is clearly that individual's wife, and they're different. They, 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 they seem to be the letters or, 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 you know, notes that could exist from a married couple. Um, and yet they, they have totally different voices that we have poetry from a stocking horse for Christina Rossetti. And this wonderful question of, wait, what would have happened if Robert Browning and Christina Rossetti were secretly, you know, falling in love with each other? How interesting and strange when weird would that be? How would that upend what we think of? within uh, poetry or, or Victorian literature or the pre-Raphaelite brethren. What, what questions does that elicit is amazing. And when when I've reread Possession, I first read in college, I reread it several years ago. When I've reread Possession, the those sort of primary sources that by crafted and created are just extraordinary. They're, they're little gems in this crown of a novel. And I have the uh, movie tie-in edition. This is the one that's not packed up, but this one is one of my five favorites. And now we move even farther forward to this is this is the one that it, it's it's in my top five and it's the one that probably on on a given day or month might slide out but it's going to be gb84 from david peace um this book is extraordinary again it feels unconventional uh and, and peace is i think 
clear in terms of, of how he was trying to, what he was trying to get at and what he calls this as an occult history. It's not history quite as it happened, but it's history sort of as it felt it happened uh, in his mind. And it is this harrowing portrayal of um, the desperate uh, lives led by characters during the 1984-1985 UK miner, coal miner strike. Um, and we have sort of two dueling uh, uh, narratives going on. We have a character who is a uh, secretary within the, um, the union of uh, coal mine workers, coal miners. And we have another character who's sort of a driver, bagman, strategist uh, on the government side. And characters aren't really named. There's the big man. Uh, the chief, things like that. And so, so by, by allowing characters to not have names, peace allows these two utterly desperate, utterly harrowing um, voices to give, to act as our windows onto this world. Uh, it's a world that's violent. It's a world that is, at, in many cases, just downright evil. Um, it is a world that is terrifying. He breaks it up with, uh, with, when the narrative switch, we get these sort of running, like almost newspaper column type transcripts of the stream of consciousness of a coal miner who's on strike, of a couple of, of friends who are, who are on strike and, and what their lives are like as the strike progresses. Um, it's an extraordinary book. I knew nothing about this, uh, this moment in history. I knew even people who are well read here in the US that I that I you know kind of turn to and discuss world history with or world events with they had and who are older than me uh, and had lived through this time had no conception that this ever occurred and so for peace to shine his light on this in a way that made someone who had again no context for it no idea of what had happened to be able to go in and dig into the history to um, understand a, a great you know a great deal of what was actually happening and then to and portray all of that in in what feels like this absolute you know um just gauntlet of prose is is an accomplishment i've rarely encountered and it's a it's a book that taps into um the darkness that can exist in societies so the darkness that can exist in humanity in a way that i find very few books ever have it's not quite a crime novel as i said peace peace is sort of known as a crime novel so it's not quite a crime novel it is as he described occult history and so uh, this is one that, that sticks with me. I, I, there are pages from it that I can't forget, instances from it that I can't forget, can't get out of my mind. Um, and I think it, that's, that's why it remains among my five favorites. It's, it's a horror, horror story um, and totally authentic and totally real. So those are my five favorites. And now for some honorable mentions. Uh, works that didn't quite make the cut, but easily could slide in or out at any given time. These won't be in chronological order, um, but someone like Hilary Mantel. Wolf Hall is just hovering right here on the edge of it. It's trying to push it middle March right now. There's, it's trying to elbow it out, you know, uh, particularly I think once I've read The Mirror and the Light, maybe it does. But uh, what Hilary Mantel has created in Wolf Hall and bringing up the bodies and I assume The Mirror and the Light is again a world unto itself. Now it is more historical uh, and we are dealing with a, a, a human consciousness in a way that we didn't, we don't quite have in those Victorian novels. But those books are incredible and it could easily be on the list. Uh, Bleak House from Charles Dickens, again, is a masterpiece. It's, I think, his his cathedral of prose. Um, and it's just it, it's just a shade behind Middlemarch, I think, for me. Uh, it just can't, doesn't quite get there. And I think it's just in terms of how perceptive Dickens and um, Marianne, Marianne Emmons were in terms of perceiving human emotion and human thought. I, I think that's just the slight edge that Middlemarch has. Uh, Women in Love from D.H. Lawrence, Parade's End from Ford Medics Ford, Brideheads, Brides Head Revisited, any of those could uh, sneak in. Uh, but they're, they're all, you know, hills or cliffs in, in, the, in the shadow of Mrs. Dalloway, along with To the Lighthouse or, or, or a couple of works from, from uh, the great Virginia Woolf. Um, Jane Austen's Pride and Prejudice, I, I think, it, it, that, that hovers around the edge. Jane Eyre, Wuthering Heights from Emily Bronte and Jane Eyre from Charlotte Bronte. Why Sargasso Sea from Jean Reese and the way that interrogates Jane Eyre. Those are all works that, that are, are sort of on this space. Um, the Murder of Roger Ackroyd from Agatha Christie would, would be there. Uh, the great Tinker Taylor Soldier Spy, uh, the spy who came in from the cold. Even uh, the Ipcris file or Funeral in Berlin from, from Len Dighton. So the Lacarian Len Dighton books, those I love. 
Um, I would say that GB84 probably edged out Get Carter from Ted Lewis. That was That's sort of the one that, that hovers right behind, I think, GB84. But Get Carter from Ted Lewis, uh, aka Jack's Return Home, is an unbelievably grim English noir masterpiece. Um, Ted Lewis's GBH would also be you know, sort of there in, in that discussion as well. And then I would re be remiss if I didn't mention probably my, two of my favorite uh, English science fiction writers, H.G. Wells, probably The Time Machine, and uh, Michael Moorcock. It could be any one of his many uh, eternal champion avatars. Uh, and then finally, of course, the great Le Morte d'Arthur from Thomas Mallory. Uh, that I would regard as a novel, even though much of it might be a translation, but that's a beautiful novel and an incredible, long, wonderful work. Uh, with a big footprint. So these, those though were my five favorites. Life and Opinions of Tristram Shandy Gentleman, Middlemarch, Mrs. Dalloway, Possession, and GB84. Let me know what yours are, and I hope everybody's having a wonderful week. Thanks.